realizing that the folks in Washington think they win elections, not us. The people in our communities win elections, not the people in Washington. We need to flip this party upside down. Now, I got the political bug real early. I was eight years old when I first started organizing my first canvas because I, in 1968, was so distraught in third grade with the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy that I started volunteering. At age 18, they waited until I was 18, I was elected my county chair. And I spent every single day of my adult life as a member of my state central committee. I'm in my uh, fifth term as the New Hampshire State Party Chair, longest person ever elected. Uh, and served four terms as chair before that, and I was executive director. That's why I make sure you give lots of respect and love to Kristen. Um, I served 18 years in the New Hampshire House where I was the Democratic whip. Every single minute of that was in the Republican uh, majority. The Republicans were in the majority. Now, for the last eight years, I've served as president of the State Chairs Association. That means that the 57 states and territories got together, the chairs and the vice chairs, and they elected who their leader should be. Four times. Nobody's ever elected, been elected four times. I've been elected four times as president of the ASDC, representing the grassroots of the party of the officers. I am the only officer of the Democratic National Committee that was not pre-selected. I'm the only one that actually had to run for office and represented your vote and your voice. Now, that's sort of my background. But my record is, when I was growing up in New Hampshire, it was a solid Republican state. People didn't even come here and campaign in the general election. It didn't matter. In the 10 years I've been chair, we've won 11 out of 13 statewide races. We've won all three of the presidential elections. We have two year terms for government. We've elected five out of the last six in the presidential. Three out of the four US Senate seats and nine out of 12 congressional seats. I know how to win. It's not about being on TV, folks. It's about getting into the communities. We need to invest into the communities, not more television ads. They take a few states, they send $100 million worth of TV ads in, and they think they're winning elections. Guess what? They're not winning elections. If you want to hear more about my plans, rayfordnc.com. First thing that we've got to do is we've got to address the elephant in the room, or the 800 pound gorilla, whatever you want to talk about. We've got to look at what we did in this nominating process. Because if we do not address it and fix it, we have lost millions of voters. They either voted for Jill Stein or wrote in Bernie Sanders or simply didn't vote. No. Neutrality. I was the chair of the New Hampshire Democratic Party during both the 2008 and the 2016. Nobody suggests. You ask Bernie Sanders, you ask Hillary Clinton, you ask Dennis Kucinich, you ask anyone that ran for president if I was not 100% neutral and 100% fair. In fact, when my Secretary of State said, Bernie Sanders is not a Democrat, you can't appear on the ballot. I took him to the ballot law commission. I had his name put on the ballot. And just to make sure, when Bernie went to file in December, I went with him to the Secretary of State's office and made sure that the Secretary of State actually accepted his papers in front of the national press. Because I wanted to make sure that the voters of New Hampshire had a choice. That's what being neutral is all about. Now, the debates. It should not be up to one person or his or her staff to decide the schedule, the timing, and who gets to participate. My reform is it goes to the executive committee of the DNC. There's over 40 members representing people from all across the country. Same with the joint fundraising agreement. Personally, no more in a primary. I would not, if I was chair of the DNC, I would not sign a joint fundraising agreement ever again. It's up to the states if you want to do that, but no more if there's in a primary, it is too much. Reforming the superdelegate system. Yeah. The votes at the convention need to reflect the votes of the state. We've got a unity commission. The next year has the votes to make appointments to that commission. They will swing the votes. Make sure that everyone is committed to reforming the system. And the caucus system is going to be looked at by the Unity Commission too. I 100% support that. It was very confusing for a lot of voters around the country that get their information online. And in one state, independents can vote. One state, only Democrats can vote. One state, you're there for a whole day. Another state, you're there for five minutes. Let's get these rules all together so we can work it, uh, work together. Democratic National Committee. For those of you who are on the Democratic National Committee, you know the dirty secret. We don't know what the hell is going on in that building. I've been the vice, one of the five vice chairs of the DNC. I know no more 
about the operation, the governance of the DNC than anybody else in this room. That's got to stop. The membership of the DNC needs to be engaged and involved. The officers do, the executive committee. We need to clean our own house up. Now, how are we going to do this? So first, clean up the mess. Second, rebuild. I offered a 15-point program, uh, and it's on my web website and my Facebook page, on how to strengthen state parties. As I said, I've been involved with state parties my entire life. I think this 15-point program, and it is for every single state, not the battleground states, not the blue states, not the reds, it's for every state, and it adds a lot of incentives for even further growth. We need to be in every neighborhood and in every community. My proposal is, is that the DNC partners with the state parties and local committees, and we have a permanent Democratic headquarters in every single congressional district across the country. Every single thing. We need to get back into the neighborhoods. We need to talk, start talking to people uh, again. Uh, I believe that if we reach out and we actually have, you know, this is the lesson we learned in New Hampshire. Uh, 2014, 2016 were not good years for Democrats, especially in the battleground states. New Hampshire, purple state, both times we won U.S. Senate races, both times we did better uh, with get out the vote. How did we do that? Because of the investment we've made in the local committees and the communities, it has a direct impact. We have a very small state physically and population-wise. So it's, everything's all the same, but why is one, one community significantly higher turnout than another community? It has to do with the amount of local people talking to local people. But we don't get investments for that. We have to raise every penny for that because the people who are in Washington think that the way to do it is add another TV ad for $10,000. Can you imagine if just a small percentage of that money was actually invested in hiring local people to talk to the people in their community, whether it's the Latino community or into the African American community or the LGBT community or in the millennials. All the, they need people that they understand. The results were clear in New Hampshire and that's why we started doing it ourselves. We are also the only battleground state that said hell no to, to Hillary's campaign. Hillary's campaign said, oh, we're just going to send you who you're going to get out the vote. We're like, no, we're going to talk to them first. That's why Hillary won New Hampshire, where all those other battlegrounds went down. We ID'd our people. You've read the stories. How many states pulled out Donald Trump voters because they bothered to talk to them for, for the first time? This is uh, absolutely absurd. Okay. I know. All right. I see you. Um, <laughs> Listen, our message is simple. It's the same message that we've always had. We just forget to talk about it. It is about hope and opportunity. We offer hope and opportunity to every single American. We are the party that represents the 99% of Americans. We can send that message to every community. We don't have to say, oh, we gotta stop talking to the African American community because we gotta talk, talk to the white working class community. Oh, we gotta stop talking to the seniors because we gotta talk to the millennials. We can talk to all of them. We can talk to all of them. It is about hope and opportunity. And let me tell you one thing, the New Hampshire Democratic Party, why we've been successful, we don't pull any goddamn punches. And Donald Trump and the Republican Congress and every Republican governor and Republican majority in the House needs to know the Democratic Party is alive and well and will hold them accountable for every sleazy thing that they do. Thank you so much. Somewhere in Texas right now, there is a, a little girl wondering whether the detention squad is gonna take her parents away. Somewhere in this country, there's somebody in their 50s, maybe 60s, who's got about three grand in the bank and doesn't know how they're going to make it on Social Security alone, especially why people are threatened to privatize it. Somewhere in the Midwest, there's somebody thinking, man, will the plant close? If it does, what are we going to do? And somebody's loved one is hooked on opioids, maybe died. Let me tell you, somebody's son or daughter might have got roughed up or even shot by the police. Who's going to be the agent for them? Who's going to say to that Muslim family, you know, we're not going to let nobody register you. If they try to register you, us, you they're going to register us too. We stand, together. we stand together. We are united. 
We come together and we are going to stand together and the Democratic Party must be that agent. Think about this, friends. We had the first woman nominee for a major party and we didn't win that election against the most sexist and misogynistic person who's ever run for that seat. This is hitting people right in the heart. But somebody has got to be the one to stand up and fight for Americans. And I tell you, the Democratic Party is not for the Democrats. It's for the American people. And the Democratic Party has got to be that agent to stand up for economic justice for all and everyone. And it's got to stand up for everybody's human and civil rights. We don't have to pick. we got to do both. Now, let me just tell you, why am I running for chair of the DNC? I did not wake up the day after the election and say, hey, why don't, why don't I start working on being the chair of the DNC? The truth is that I've been working on voter turnout for literally years. I found out years ago that instead of just saying, let's go skip the red areas, skip the blue areas, let's go to the swing areas and only talk to likely voters, I've learned long ago that that was a losing strategy. That's why, you know, I've been in elections. I've stood for elections eight times and never lost. But more than that, I've had Democrats win all over this country. And if being the chair of the DNC means getting Democrats elected, I believe that I'm uniquely qualified for that job. In my district, in my state, in my district, I used to have the lowest turnout in the state of Minnesota in 2006. Now we have the highest turnout. How do we arrive at that? Well, one, we turn on during the off year. We don't just campaign during the election year. Two, we go to the grassroots. We knock doors. We have telephone calls. We have conversations. In the summer of 2015, just the summer, only the summer, we had 9,000 conversations. And people say, well, Keith, you know you're in a safe seat. Why are you doing all that campaign? Because if I don't, Mark Dayton, our governor, would not win. Amy Klobuchar and Al Franken would not win. And our four other statewide officers would not win. We're blue all at the top, you guys, and it's because in the fifth district, we turn out the vote. And that is exactly what's gonna happen in this country if you elect me as, as chair of the DNC. But don't think I'm gonna do it by myself. Nobody ever could. It will be you on the ground. Just like you guys got out there in Bear County and in Harris County and really kicked some tail this last election, I, you know what, I'll give uh, 10 seconds for them to give themselves a hand if y'all want to do it. <laughs> I just want to tell you that, we are, that the nation saw you do that, and we are incredibly proud of you. And I'm telling you, the day when people come into Texas and raise money and take it all out of Texas must end. We got to invest in Texas. We need money in Texas. Now, I want you to know, I got a document here which lays out and fine to tell the work that we are going to do. But it's not that I'm just telling you what I'm going to do. We've done the work. We've actually achieved what we are telling you we want to do. And I just want to let you know that I talked to a lot of good friends. And I talked to a lot of friends, and a lot of them have told me, you know, Keith, this is early on when I got in the race. Keith, if you, if you want to be DNC chair, we need you to, to, to be full time. Well, the last chair wasn't, so I thought, well, should I have to? After listening to you, I came to the conclusion that I did have to. Yes. And so I will be a full time. I will leave my job as a member of the United States Congress and be your chair full time if you elect me. Wow. Now let me just tell you this. I'm not a guy who doesn't have a job and looking for one. I have a job that I love, but I'm willing to leave it because it is just that important. Those people who I mentioned when I first started talking to you desperately need that kind of person, fighting for them 100% of the time, 365 days, a year. Now let me tell you, it's been my pleasure to campaign with you right here in Texas. You know, Bernard Hennessy also and I know we've, been, we've campaigned right here in Texas. He knows. And i tell you who else knows. A young woman by the name of Sarah DeMarcia. There she is. There she is. That young woman got into a race where she, people told her, you can't win, forget about it. You're wasting your time. Well, guess what? She went up from 36% of the last one to 44%. This time, she increased the vote by 7,000%. And you know what, sir? If you keep on knocking on the door, you're going to win that race. <laughs> and this is the kind of campaign we're going to do. I'm
I'm not just coming to Texas to help people run for Congress. We're talking about state representative. Do you know we have lost 9,000? No, 935 state representative seats in this country since 2008. Something has gone wrong, folks. We got to revitalize the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party must be the party where working people of all backgrounds feel that that is the one that's going to fight for us. The Democratic Party's going to fight for us, and we have got to be the people who make it so. You know, I'm very proud that we had a million people on the live stream Wednesday night with our revolution. A million people turned out. Why did they turn out? Because they are hungry to get out there. But you know, right here in Texas, we got 336 people who signed a petition to help support me to be DNC chair. Why do I point this out to you? Because it will require the grassroots energy in order for us to succeed. It is going to require people in every county of this state, all of the counties in this 245 counties in Texas to get out there and move this agenda. And I'm saying, yeah, 50 state strategy, absolutely. But what about a 3,141 county strategy? We got to get granular, folks. We got to get to the root because we got to get to the resource. We got to get the resources closest to the voter. Closest to the voter because last time I heard, elections are won by getting out more votes than the other side, not spending more on TV ads than the other side. Some people think GOT means go on television. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, it shouldn't even get out the vote. But we're gonna get we're gonna be getting out the vote 365 days a year with conversations and literal relationship building, so that people know and trust the Democratic Party to fight for them. Now I just want to tell you, right now in North Carolina, when we win, we still got to fight. You all saw how we win the gubernatorial election, and they're still trying to undermine the government. This is why I got out there and hit them on that and criticized them for that. It's not just going to be dealing with federal stuff. It's going to be state stuff. It's going to be county stuff. It's going to be city stuff that we are all unified fighting together. Now, I just want to tell you this. I was very proud to go to seven states for Hillary Clinton. She is a great and honorable public servant, and I was proud to campaign for her. I was also very proud to campaign for Bernie Sanders. I'm telling you right now that I am a unity candidate who will bring all of our factions together, who will honor the people who have been here serving our party for years and years and years, but also welcome in the new energy that we absolutely got to have to win these elections. We need both. We can't have one or the other. We've got to have institutional memory and energy and fresh ideas. We need all of that. And I will work with all of my fellow candidates in this race. We are all friends, guys. We are all cool, we are all tight, and we, no matter who wins this race, we're all gonna support each other. And so you all need to be pushing for unity constantly and thinking about creative ideas that we can rouse up the grassroots so 2018 can be the brand new year where we start the new Democratic Party that is grassroots, that is active, that is engaged, and that is ready to fight for all Americans, no matter who you are or where you come from, we are on your side, and you can trust the Democratic Party to fight for you. Thank you, I love you guys, and I ask you to go. I am so excited to be in Texas today. Uh, I announced my candidacy yesterday. I found out about this forum about noon and uh, got on a flight and flew all night. Um, I have one piece of business before I talk about myself. Um, and that is that as an executive director in Idaho, I know that it takes money to put on these type of affairs. So I want to challenge all of the other candidates in the race to post on your websites and your uh, Facebook pages, uh, ask for the Texas Democratic Party. I did that when I landed at 5 a.m. this morning. Um, we've got to make sure that our state parties have the resources that they need. Um, and I believe in putting my money where my mouth is. So uh, candidates in the room, uh, I put that challenge in front of you. Um, I am not a typical candidate, so I'm not going to sound like a typical candidate. The reality is, is that I've been doing the hard work in Idaho and at the national level um, and trying to figure out some really big problems. As I go through the country um, talking to paid professionals who are much smarter than I am, um, I ask big questions. And most of the time I find that people are overwhelmed with the questions that I ask. One of the things that's really important to me is that we look towards the future and we figure out how we build a 21st century party that is full of energy, that has the resiliency and the innovation to be able to look at the changing realities of our society. 
We have 50% of the country who didn't vote in this election. And I love that I heard uh, one of the committee reports saying, that we're gonna talk to the folks in Texas who didn't vote. That's exactly what we need to be talking about. Why didn't they vote? I can guarantee that it is not the same reason for that whole group of people. They all have different reasons, but we need to be having that conversation. And we need to be creating a party that answers whatever we hear back from them. We need to be thinking about the big questions that are out there, the really big problems. And there's a ton of them, so I won't go into them. You guys think about them every day. You're on the grassroots um, doing the hard work. I went this morning to sit in on your committees um, because I believe the DNC chair needs to be down um, with the people doing the work. The leadership style that we've had for decades, um, it's what I call old power versus new power, which is I think the conversation that we're having in our society where you have a leader at the top and you have people underneath is not gonna work any longer for this society that we live in. We need to have a flat structure where everybody is involved in not just the work that needs to be done, but the ideas and the decisions that need to be done. So one of the things that you're gonna see from me in the next two months is engagement at the grassroots level, but in a very different way. I'm gonna be asking people to join me um, via my Facebook page and my website, wethednc.com, or we the DNC on Facebook, and create work groups, and decide on what they feel like the top 10 big questions are that we need to be answering so that 40 years from now, we are the strongest party in this country and we've figured out how to get the 50% of Americans who aren't voting to participate in democracy at every single level. I'm gonna take those 10 questions and I'm gonna welcome people to create work groups. And over the course of the next two months, I'm gonna have those folks work in those work groups trying to brainstorm at least a process on how we start answering some of these questions. We can't just focus on the next two years, the next four years. Those are important. And I think that we have to depend on our state parties to be able to do that work. You guys have done amazing work in this state. You should be a template. A lot of your programs should be a template to get out to the other states for what's happening. You know how to do that work. We can easily at the DNC get resources, create a strong partnership to be able to empower states to do the election work for the two years and the four years in their states. We also need to be creating some leadership to be able to take on some of the problems that are facing our society at the bigger level. And not the ideological problems. We have had a great debate over what we are as Democrats, whether we're liberal, whether we're moderate, and we know that we've been a big tent. We're for the people. We've always been for the people. Nobody in here thinks the exact same thing, and that's a beautiful, wonderful thing. So let's take that diversity, the diversity of thought, the diversity of the people that we have in the, the party, and put them to work. Get the great brains in our party together talking about some of these overwhelming problems, rather than just focusing on one step in front of us at a time. We can't afford to do that any longer. If we continue to do that, 20 years from now, state parties will be obsolete. There are too many issues that are facing us today to be able to afford to do that. And this is the perfect time to do it. I am sorry, but the, the problems that have flipped us right now did not suddenly appear on November 9th when we all woke up that morning shocked. And you guys had some great things to celebrate while you were also shocked, so good for you. Um, they, they have been here, right? So we need to take this as an opportunity to get excited and get passionate and really go after them. So that's what I'm all about. You can read more on readthednc.com about my bio and the things that I've done um, for state parties. Um, and I just appreciate you putting this forum together. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next we have Jamie Harrison, who is the South Carolina Democratic Party Chair, who is Director of Four Operations and Counsel for former House Majority Whip Representative James Cleburne, and is Chairman of the South Carolina Democratic Party. Thank you for having me, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Vice Chair Phillips. This is amazing. Thank you for putting this together, and thank you for having all of us be out here. I want to give a special sh shout out to Susan Shelton. Where's Susan? Susan, uh, thank you so much. As soon as this was announced, Susan sent out a tweet saying, oh, yeah, can't wait to, to see you. 
And I just want to thank her and the Texas Federation of Democratic Women who are doing outstanding work here in Texas. Uh, and Susan and, and some of the members were actually down in Charleston, South Carolina. If y'all haven't been to Charleston yet, you need to come. And she can tell you about it. Uh, we got grits and shrimp and all that good stuff, so make sure you come down. Um, but they've been doing some amazing work. And a little bird told me that you guys are about to celebrate the 50th anniversary. 30th. 30th, 30th anniversary here in, in Texas. So congratulations on that. Uh, I, I hope that all of our federations of Democratic women across the country uh, can have as much success as you guys have had here in Texas. So thank you. Guys, I, I want to thank all of you. Thank you for putting your hearts and soul on the line in this past election. I know many of you are probably just like me, still sick. And you know, I still walk around thinking that I'm just in some type of nightmare and I'm eventually going to wake up. Uh, I remember the day after the election, I have a two-year-old at home. His name is Bean. Uh, well, his name is William, but we call him Bean. And uh, uh, every morning, he says, Mommy, Daddy, uh, where are you? And so I have to go to the crib and pick him up and I bring, bring him into the bed with us. And so on the election day, uh, the day after the election day, uh, my wife and I were, were, you know, in bed. I go and get him, and he looks at me, and he looks at her, and he says, "Mommy, Daddy said," hmm. and I said, uh, holding back tears, "Yes, buddy, we're sad." You know, I was crushed, and I wasn't crushed just because Hillary won, uh, lost, or that Donald Trump won. I was crushed because of the future of this country for the next four years and the impact that it would have on my son, who is the light of my life. The impact that it would have on my grandmother, who raised me. The impact that it would have on my mom. You know, when thinking about what went wrong, over the past two years, there's been a lot of things about people feeling as if they have not been heard. Feeling as if though that they or, or the folks that they love don't matter. From the Black Lives activists going into the streets saying Black Lives Matter. To Latinos, those who have come to this country and may be undocumented, and those whose parents are, are, are children who are here, feeling as if they don't matter. To the folks in the LGBT community, LGBTQ community, fighting for their right to love who they want to love, feeling as though they are under attack. To Native Americans, the first Americans, feeling as if there's no one fighting for them. It used to be that the Democratic Party was the party that fought for all of us. It used to be that people could go to the Democratic Party and could go to its elected officials when they had issues and problems in their lives. But now what they get from us, they get TV ads, and pieces of mail, and radio spots. They no longer have that connection, that conjugate. My friends, we have to fundamentally transform the Democratic Party. We can't just be the party that goes and begs for votes every two and every four years. We have to become a community party, a community organization that goes into the communities helping people address the day-to-day -day issues that, they have to, that they're battling with. We lost that connection to the people, and we have to rebuild that. And the first way that we do that is we have to invest in our state parties. Our dean in 2006 came up with the, the 50 state strategy. And what happened in 2006? He fought tooth and nail with Rahm Emanuel and Chuck Schumer, who all they wanted was for the DNC to send them a check so that they could put more TV ads on it. But Howard Dean said, no, we can't do that. Because it's just not about the battleground states or the target states. It's about all of the states. Because you know what? Even the red states sent two U.S. senators to Washington, D.C. Even the red states send one, at least one member of Congress to Washington, D.C. And all of those people enact laws that impact all of us, regardless if we're in a blue state or a red state or a flyover state. 
We have to go back to understanding that all state parties and all states matter. And we have to invest again in our state parties. We haven't done it. We got drunk when we are off of the idea that we were able to elect Barack Obama in 2008. And we got rid of almost uh, Howard Dean's efforts in 2006. And we were still drunk in 2012 because we, yay, we were able to win again. My friends, we can't be the Democratic National Presidential Committee. We have to be the Democratic National Committee, fighting for those people, not just on the top of the ballot, but all of those fighting the good fight for Democrats on the bottom of the ballot also. That is what we have to get back to. That is where our heart is. It is those people working on the front lines that have more impact on the day-to-day -day lives of our voters than the person that sits on six, six in the White House at 1600 Pennsylvania. When we talk about voter suppression laws, when we talk about things like voter ID and all of these other efforts to curb our rights, those things are happening on a local level. Yet the DNC does not coordinate, does not invest in those folks on the local level. We have to change that. We have to transform that. But what we need, my friends, and I know, you know, we, we get caught up. What we fundamentally need, we need someone who understands how state parties operate, but also understands how Washington, D.C. operates as well. I believe I can do that. Now, you guys are going to ask, well, who's this guy? He's a big, bald-headed, black guy with a big head, big smile. Well, let me tell you a little bit about who I am. I'm Jamie Harris. I'm the chair of the South Carolina Democratic Party. I've been the chair of the South Carolina Democratic Party now for three and a half years. Was the first African American to ever chair the party in South Carolina, and the youngest. I'm 40 years old. But despite my age, I've had a lot of experience. I worked in Washington, well, just a little background. My mom had me in rural South Carolina when she was 15 years old. Had to drop out of high school, and my grandparents took care of me. I was the first in my family to go to college. Bless, went to Yale University. While at Yale, studied hard, did the good work, and then went back home to South Carolina to teach high school, and then went to Washington, D.C. And Congressman Clyburn gave me an opportunity. He said, you're a young guy, but you work hard. You have vision. And he made me executive director of the House Democratic Caucus at the age of 29. First African American, youngest person to ever do that. And then we took the House back in 2006, and uh, I worked in the whip operation. I was the guy who made sure that we had 218 votes to pass legislation to get us out of the Iraq War in order to have the Matthew Shepard, James Byrd uh, hate crimes law. I was the guy 